Hello everyone, this is anchor test video number 103, and in it I will cover this 17 pound Mantis M2 anchor of galvanized steel. It did come out at 17 pounds on my scale, and in the setting position the tip weighs about 8 pounds for a tip to total weight ratio of 47%. This is very, very high, and it is only eclipsed by the other Mantis anchor, the M1 with the roll bar. They have as much as 50% of their weight on the tip. A unique feature of the M2 anchor is this very thin ear. Notice on the M1 anchor, we have the presence of a roll bar, and on virtually every other anchor, they have added material to the, to the ear, and I believe they've done that to prevent this ear from sinking into the seabed. So that'll be something for you to watch as you look at the footage. Uh, ask yourself whether or not this ear does sink in, and if it does, does it matter? Structurally, I believe this anchor is robust. Note that the shank, however, is thinner than the other five anchors in this 17 to 22 pound range, but the shank is quite a bit shorter, and it has lots of height, plus it's made of a very high grade of steel, so I really don't have any problem with the strength of the shank, and for that matter, the fluke is also very strong. Uh, as is the case with all of the ballasted, thickened, towed anchors, we don't have to worry about catching the toe of the anchor under a ledge and then lifting up and, and bending that toe downward. There's just so much material here, it's, it's just way over strength. Now the shank, which is cut from a single piece of plate, is removable. The fluke, it is made of two pieces. The forward half was cast, I believe, and the rear portion is plate, and it is welded together along this line and perhaps around this structure here. Now this slot that the shank fits into is all cast, and as a result, I believe the, the fit or the tolerances had to be kept fairly loose because casting just isn't a very precise way to create a shape. The result of that is quite a bit of wiggling, and I'm not, I, there's really no structural problem with this. In fact, it might be a good thing. Uh, having a lot of slop or space between this junction means that mud and other debris that may collect in there would be easier to sort of wash and sort of wiggle out. So that's a good thing. Another thing that's uh, different about this anchor is it's this shank is retained with a single bolt. It does bear up against the forward part of the fluke with this notch, and I believe that is most of the load is carried there. However, a fair amount of shear load is on this bolt, and the bolt is, is generously sized. I'm not worried at all about any of this structurally. However, this is not a smooth shanked bolt. We can see threads all the way, and I don't know if you'll be able to see this or not, but where this bolt was heavily loaded, the threads are actually digging into, you can feel it if you run a pencil in there, They're, they've dug into the galvanizing at least, and again, this is not a structural problem. You're never going to shear this bolt, but it's just not ideal. For the issue of galvanizing and corrosion, the anchor is top notch. Uh, we've got just two simple pieces that can be regalvanized simply. There's no lead, there's no dissimilar metals. Uh, we've got no hollow structures, no, no roll bar tubes or hollow shanks that could have rust festering unknowingly inside. Uh, the quality of the galvanizing is quite good. It, it's as good as any modern galvanizing that I've seen. Uh, it's certainly not up to, up to the same standard as the old school galvanizing that I've seen on, say, original Bruce and original CQR anchors. But I did subject this to a good jostling in the cobblestone, and just a quick glance, I only see one tiny chip here and one tiny chip there. I did take a blade and try to get under it, but no, this, this, this galvanizing is stuck on quite well. So uh, corrosion galvanizing is really, really doesn't get much better. Last thing we'll talk about before we get to the footage is chain attachment. This is a 5 16th shackle, which would be good for quarter inch chain. That fits perfectly and does not bind. Here's a 3 8 shackle, good for 5 16th chain, does not bind. And a 7 16th shackle, which would be good for 3 8 chain, that, that's really overkill for this size anchor. It does not go. I will note that the 
attach hole here is nicely chamfered. In fact, the whole anchor, everywhere, all these corners are nicely chamfered, and that goes a long way toward keeping galvanizing on the anchor. All right, that's enough shop talk. Let's get to the bottom and see how this anchor performs. Okay, we'll get things started with the 180 degree reset testing. We are in the sandy mud seabed, and note that I'm using a short chain road, only 12 feet of chain. We're at 3.5 to one scope. And for those that are familiar with my large anchor reset testing, I, I always used a all chain, heavy 3 8 inch all chain road. And it's frankly, it's quite a bit of a different test. Uh, with the short chain road, you'll notice on the during the actual reset, the chain is not laying on the bottom. It's actually passing up overhead and pulling upward. And this results in the anchor releasing virtually every time. Contrasted with the all chain testing, uh, in that case, the chain sort of laid on the surface and kind of sort of created a J shape as it took up the slack. And that, that sort of shape would often have the anchors rotate in the seabed. So uh, I do all the small anchors with this road, and it, like I say, it's quite a bit different test, and frankly, it's a much more challenging test. And that's just what I'm after. I want to see if an anchor can reset after it is released from the bottom. And for the anchors that have trouble, it usually results in the fact that they'll have mud attached to it. But this anchor does not have that problem. It is resetting every time. Sometimes it takes, oh, five, ten feet, maybe, maybe a little more. But no, it gets the job done perfectly. I am giving it a about a 500 pound burst of power after each of these resets to ensure that it is indeed uh, firmly engaged. So that was the sixth reset, and it worked just great. But here on the seventh reset, uh, the camera tethers uh, foul the anchor right at the tip, and I believe it, it, that is the reason uh, for this lengthy drag. In fact, it never does reset. It eventually uh, turns upright and starts to bite in, and I can feel some lurching topside in the boat, but after a long, long drag, I realized there's something amiss. Uh, I did not know what the problem was until I reviewed the footage, and I actually did conduct a few more pulls uh, but the, the results were the same. This anchor just keeps on resetting as long as the camera is not fouled. I will show you some of the uh, resetting at 5 to 1 scope, and for this it was 100% all 10 tries. You can scrutinize it and, and maybe ask yourself, is it resetting a little faster? due to having a more favorable uh, scope. And, I, you know, I don't see a big difference. Maybe it's a little little bit faster, but there's still some, some times when it drags along, um, you know, one or two meters maybe. Some of you are probably wondering how this non-roll bar mantis compares to their roll bar mantis anchors at this reset. Um, the, the, the big 45 pound roll bar mantis was brilliant at this test. It, uh, we, I've been showing that for years, how it just sets and resets instantaneously. However, the 13 pound roll bar mantis, it was actually poor at this test. It, it showed evidence of mud fouling. Now I have tested the 17 pound roll bar mantis. You haven't seen the footage yet, and it was very good. And is it as good as this 17 pound uh, M2 non-roll bar mantis, and boy, it's really close, but I think this uh, M2 might actually be a little better than the same sized roll bar mantis. So the anchor did reset uh, each and every of the 10 tries. Uh, however, the camera tether gets fouled up in the anchor. Uh, it didn't affect the anchor's performance. It's still reset, but we don't get to see anything from this point on. And I won't bore you with the final uh, segments of this because it's just a dark black screen.
Next is just a straight line holding power test. Uh, the scope is back down to 3.5 to 1. We're still with this mostly rope road, so very little, if any, help from the chain catenary. Got the video playback speed at four times normal. Uh, this keeps the video at a reasonable length, but I'll slow it back down to real time here at the final thrust settings that the anchor can hold. And keep in mind that for a small boat, say in the low 20, maybe 24 feet long, uh, 600 pounds of thrust has got to be equivalent to some very, very high wind. Uh, storm, maybe a small hurricane even. I would be very, very surprised if anybody would try to anchor with a mostly rope road at 3.5 to 1 scope in a storm. You'd always be seeking a larger anchorage or enough room to increase your scope. But I like to test things to the limit, and there you have it. At that scope, there's your limit in this seabed. Next is another straight line holding power check. We've got the scope back up to 5 to 1, and it is at this scope and with this test that I plug in the data into my data chart uh, to make comparisons between the anchors. We'll note that there is a lot less motion at this uh, little bit uh, longer scope. We do have the camera speed or the playback speed at 4 times. But much, much more holding power, much less motion than at the 3.5 to 1. And then here at the final power setting, it's uh, the maximum that this boat can pull. It's uh, 1,150 pounds. I've got the camera down at the normal real-time speed. And it almost looks to me like the motion gets slower here toward the end. So. It's doing real good. I don't. We have no idea what the release thrust would be, if any. Maybe it just keeps dragging endlessly, no matter how hard you pull on it. But it's very, very good. Again, this is a small anchor with a boat down in the low 20 feet, thousand pounds of pull. It's got to be a tremendous amount of wind. The next three tests are a veering test, and in this the boat is pulling with a 500-pound uh, pull while it is moving sideways, and I, I let the boat swing all the way through 180 degrees. I did change the road. This, this road has 80 feet of 5 16 chain and the balance nylon rope. We are at 5 to 1 scope, and now we can see the chain in the lower left of the screen arcing around. Again, the boat's moving to starboard. I'm shooting for about two knots. Often it's maybe a little less than that. But what we can see so far is that the anchor is not moving very far. And the better anchors at this test uh, do this exact thing. They just pivot. And then the best will hold the maximum thrust at the end of the 180 degree pull. We'll see how this one does. But the veering portion is... Excellent. Can't really can't really ask for much better. We are viewing this at four times playback speed, and there's very very little motion so far. It's really doing very well. It's holding lots and lots of power, but here at the very final upper limits of what we can pull, we do start to get some motion. So again, a, a couple anchors can do this test and not move at all afterward but this one this one moves briskly you couldn't really tell how fast it was it certainly wasn't two knots maybe it was a knot of motion
Next veering test is at the clean, loose sand seabed. Got the same mixed road, 80 feet of chain, the balance is nylon. Uh, same 5 to 1 scope, same 500 pounds of baseline pulling force as I commence the veer to starboard. And in the right part of the screen there, you can start to see the chain moving downward. It'll transcribe an arc in the sand there, you can start to see. And uh, when an anchor is not moving, what you end up with is a semicircle shape in that chain chain mark. And that's what we get here. This, this anchor, boy, it is very, very solid. Initial part, I just don't see it moving at all. I think toward the very, very end of the veer, might move a foot or so. Uh, and then as the as the veer is stopped and the thrust is increased, we do get more motion. But during this veer, it just doesn't get any better. Now the camera's getting a little bit closer. So that tells me the, oh, the anchor might have, like I say, maybe moved a foot or so. Maybe it's just the fact that the anchor is straightening out that it's pulling the camera down. Maybe being so deeply buried... Uh, maybe the anchor technically was not moving forward, but it is now at this point. The boat straightened out, we're increasing thrust, and the anchor is moving very slowly, nice and steady. And I'll, I'll slow down this four times playback speed here shortly. There, now we're, now we're at normal speed, so you can get an idea of just how little motion that is. Very, very good performance. Actually, there was only one anchor it was the fortress that had zero motion here. I think there was another anchor or two that maybe had a little bit less motion in this. So this wasn't this wasn't perfect here. There was a, several anchors that were a, a, a little bit better. But can't complain. 17 pound anchor, 1100 pounds of force. Uh, that's that's fantastic performance in my book. And for the third and final veering test, we are in Scow Bay, which is the soft mud site that I have been using. Now for the 20 pound range anchors, the target thrust for the veer is 335 pounds, but this anchor could not hold it. It was dragging at more than two knots on the initial set. So I reduced the power to 220 pounds. It seemed solid, so I went ahead and commenced with the veer. And, and that's what we're seeing now. It's the tail end of it at real time speed. We don't get too many pictures of the bottom here, but we can tell from the material that's in the water column, plankton or whatever that is, it's not moving much. So we can tell the anchor's fairly solid. Again, it's a reduced amount of pull compared to the other anchors. And all the numbers here are lower. I, ju I just don't get good holding out of any anchor, really, other than a, than a fortress. Uh, most anchors here, the, the holding is far, far less than in my other seabeds. So this is, is a pretty low number, but take it with a grain of salt. Most anchors are pretty poor here. Anyway, once the, the boat motion was stopped and the power was increased, the anchor did begin moving again. But like every other anchor I've tested here, the holding is better after the veer. So apparently all that time during the veer, the anchor has an opportunity to sort of screw itself into the seabed, so to speak. And the anchor never did release, but toward the end here at, I believe it was 500 pounds of thrust, the boat did achieve a two knot speed. And it's at that point I discontinue testing. Once, once the boat's moving more than two knots, I, I cut it off. Final test site is the cobblestone seabed. 
I'm using lots of road here. It's fresh shallow water, nice and long chain road, and in not one test here has any anchor been able to hold hard enough to, say, lift the chain off from the seabed. So every anchor gets infinite scope for all intents and purposes. But in spite of that, no anchor has really held a lot of holding power here. Uh, it's a very challenging seabed. Uh, many have suggested that the, the, the main point of my doing these tests is to show people uh, that you should not anchor in, in cobblestone of this size. And that may be, but may, there may be a time when you just don't have a choice. Maybe you are in an area that just has this kind of seabed and, and you just kind of have to live with what you get. And for this anchor, what you get is about 160 pounds of holding power. I drug it a, a lot more than what I'm going to show you. And the twice it held 160 and it would drag at 180. So I feel comfortable. That's a, a consistent number. It's actually pretty good. It's, it's the best holding power for any 17-pound anchor I have tested. The 20, a couple 21 and 22-pound anchors did better. But uh, that's, that's pretty remarkable. I'll say that this is one of only maybe two other anchors out of, you know, what have I tested, 20 or so anchors here. Uh, only a handful have been able to bury their flukes completely, and this one does. You can see just a little bit of that ear, and, well, that was close enough in my book. That was a buried fluke. Uh, it's probably as a result of having a nice tall shank. But uh, for whatever reason, this anchor was a real winner here in the cobblestone. Okay, let's dive right into the anchor comparison chart. Now, one week ago, I tested the 21-pound Viking 10, and it knocked off the Spade S60 for the top spot in this group of anchors. But it only rained king for one week because there is a new sheriff in town and it is called a Mantis M2. I will note that the Viking 10 does not have any 1s and 2s in its ratings. The Mantis M2 has a couple 2 ratings in the soft mud. Therefore, one could argue that the Viking should challenge that top spot since it's, you know, it's just either good or great everywhere and nowhere is it, uh, you know, less than average. That said, notice that this is a head-to-head -head comparison. I've made no allowances or compensation for lower weights or sizes. And if Mantis were to produce a 21-pound M2, well, maybe those soft mud twos would upgrade to a three and at that point its superiority would be clear last thing i'll mention about the performance chart is that you're free to ignore any columns that you find you know that don't apply to your situation for example you know if money's not an issue you could remove the price column and for that matter you could remove the galvanizing and corrosion columns and if you did the Spade S60 would regain the top spot on this chart. Well, I think Mantis Anchors deserves a congratulation. They have kind of done the impossible. They built an anchor without a roll bar. It will therefore fit on most boats. It is strong. Corrosion will be manageable. And performance is excellent. They did it all at a very favorable price. So should we go ahead and proclaim the M2 as the world's best 20-pound range anchor? Probably not quite yet. I really should continue seeking out some other seabed types, the hard sand, maybe soupy mud. Also, I can think of at least three other contenders which we should compare this to first, and that would be the Ultra in the 20-pound range, uh, a Rockna Vulcan, and the new Lumar Epsilon looks very interesting to me. Okay, that's all I got for the 17-pound M2. Do stay tuned. Soon I'll be testing and showing you the results for the 45-pound M2 anchor and also the positively gargantuan Viking 20. Uh, I haven't tested either of these, so I'm just as curious as you are as to whether or not they will sort of shake up the 45-pound range anchors uh, like the smaller M2 and Viking did. Okay, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to all of you for watching and donating to this project. Without your support, this most certainly would not be possible. 
As always, anchor safely. So long.